guys ready for some high school drama? It's good, right? You know, like that old hee haw thing, you'll never hear one of us repeating gossip, so you better be sure to listen close the first time. I'm only going to say this once. This week, uh, I, such a great illustration of, I think, what is going on in the world and in our own hearts. This week was uh, homecoming week for Union City, and they, uh, so they had, you know, different events throughout the week. Well, one of the events is the Powder Puff football game where the different classes, the girls in the classes play each other, so you got the freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors all playing each other. And it's kind of funny because, you know, there's only so many kids on the field at one time, and so there's only like maybe six or seven or something, eight people on the field at a time. So it's not a full team. And uh, so you'll have like the freshmen playing the seniors and the juniors and the sophomores were playing each other. And then the winners of each will play for the Super Bowl and the other the losers will play for the toilet bowl. And so <laughs> it was, it's pretty fun because it's not real, you know? Like they play pretty hard and fast with the rules and stuff. And the, there's there's reps out there, but you know, like for instance, they'll spot the ball not where it was, but five, they'll, they'll give them five yards on the spot of the ball and just, Things like that. So it's, it's not like really stringent rules to begin with. Well, it ends up that Emily's grade, the freshman, they won. And so they were really happy. They really celebrated. And the, they beat the sophomores in the Super Bowl. And then the sophomores, they didn't take that very well. So then they, they, well, like, just they weren't very good sports about it. So, like, they would write taunts and stuff, and they stuck them through the vents on the lockers of the freshmen, like taunting them and calling them cheaters and things like that. And well, so one of the other events then was the float. So each class makes a float for the parade. And the sophomores, they had a really good float. The freshmen, even, you know, like our daughter, she said, oh, the sophomores are going to win because their float is just really good and, and everything. We heard later that the freshmen won the float contest as well. And we didn't know why. We were like, wow, everybody said the sophomores were going to win. Well, it turns out that the sophomore class advisor heard that they were bad sports in the powder puff game, so she disqualified them in the float contest. So now it's really bad. Like, oh. They, I mean, now, there is a purpose for what I'm telling you here. It's not just because I want to tell everybody that. Imagine, because I was thinking about this as I was watching them on the football field playing hard and fast with the rules and stuff. I was, this is what was going through my mind. Imagine seeing a football field, because that's what, th these girls, they don't play football. Like they were running downfield and throwing forward passes and stuff. They had no idea what was supposed to happen. You know, they were just lost uh, in so many ways. But imagine a field. Imagine you see a field and you don't know the rules. And so you just start making them up, you know? Like, you know the, the goal post and the end that you're supposed to kick the ball through? What if you decided the goal is to throw the ball through there? And so when they would throw the ball through there, they would all celebrate. And imagine the lines around the field. Imagine if they thought the goal is to shove all the opponent, play, opponent players off the field. And so every time they did that, they celebrated. They see the structure. They see the structure of the field, and they know that, okay, something's supposed to happen here. There's some kind of a competition that's supposed to take place here. But they make up the rules as they go. Imagine how that would feel. Like, would, how do I know if I've hit the target or not? How do I know if it's right or wrong? How, Worse yet, imagine being told the rules and then being told halfway through, the rules have all changed. They're all changing. So it used to be that you had to kick the ball through there, and now, in fact, it is. You have to throw the ball through there. I mean, imagine, well, I don't know these rules. I don't know how to play according to these rules. I've set up my whole life playing according to these other rules. Then imagine the terrible sportsmanship that would follow when that team that lost feels like they've been cheated. Well, you changed the rules. That's not fair. God gave a law. God gave a law 
And people actually started to believe, even though God has continually said in the Bible what he sent the law to do. People even to this day continue to take that law and play by different rules. They see the structure of it, and they actually think that they are owed reward based on their faulty use of the field according to their own rules and feel cheated when it doesn't work out their way. And then get angry when an authority figure says, you have messed up, you, that you're not doing right. And then they just get more angry and double down on that anger and that frustration and feeling of being cheated. We're going to see in these psalms today that God is working out a plan. And there are people in the world that are working out an entirely different plan. And expecting God to go along with it. To be rewarded, or to, to reward them for it. I mean, that's exactly what happened with the Pharisees. It's exactly what happened. We're keeping the rules. We're keeping the law. We're doing this for your glory, Lord. And God says, I, I didn't ask you to do this for my glory. You think you're doing this for my glory. You're not. You think you're doing this for me. You're not doing this for me. I didn't ask you to do this. When, but nevertheless, you owe us now. You owe us. And when God comes and the Pharisees perceive that he's changed the rules, what do they want to do? They want to kill the lawgiver. They want to kill the, the new lawgiver. The one in authority who says... You're not doing this rightly. I've come to show you the actual way. And they don't want that. They're like, no, 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 we'll see about that. The anger, the frustration, the, the thought that somehow God has dealt unjustly with them. In the 46th Psalm, we read, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And I've heard that used for the times in our lives when we're going through trials. And that, that is true as far as it goes. God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will have no fear, though the earth gives way. That, that's the issue. It's not just God is our refuge and strength when I lose my job and have to figure out how I'm going to pay my bills. That, well, God is our refuge and strength. I mean, when the neighbor hates me, God is our refuge and strength. Right? I mean... No, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. In other words, this is catastrophic things. God is a very present help in times of the earth completely melting away. Then we see there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So what we see here is there is this earth, and God is our refuge and strength even when this earth is melting away. Think about what's happening in North Carolina right now. Think about what's happening in South Carolina. They, you're just there one minute and your house is underwater. And you think, oh, well, I just don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. I mean, they say leave, but then the last time they said leave, I left, and then it didn't do anything, and so maybe I'll just stay, and then before you know it, your house is underwater. Imagine that. Now imagine that on a final scale. Imagine that that's, that's the end. That that's the entire end. God is still our refuge and strength. He is the only one that sees us through the final catastrophe, the final apocalypse, the final revealing of the sons of God and the enemies of God, the earth dwellers, the final separation. So we see here something cataclysmic happening to the earth. And we see a city of God with a river that's flowing through it. And God is in the midst of her. And we see in Revelation 22 that 
this theme is quoted as heaven. There's a river flowing through heaven and the trees of life are planted along its banks and God is in the midst and everything is perfect. Nothing accursed is there. Why? Because the curse has finally met its fulfillment. The world has been destroyed and nothing accursed is left. Nothing accursed remains. It's all been handily thrown into the lake of fire and all that remains is God and his people in a perfect world. Verse 6, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. When? When is the God of Jacob our fortress? The God of Jacob is our fortress when the God of Jacob is the destroyer. I mean, think about that. What is happening here? That the psalmist is celebrating God as our refuge. The destruction of the world. At whose hand? Well, he says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. I mean, they're angry about it. They're furious. It's almost like they've gathered together for battle. The earth is tottering. Things bad are happening. There's earthquakes and stars seem to be falling from the sky and the moon seems to be turning to blood and all sorts of bad things are happening. He utters his voice, the earth melts. Who is God a fortress from? God. God is our fortress from God. And this is where Christians tend to mess it up. We think that God is our fortress from the devil. We think that God is our fortress from demons. We think that God is our fortress from sin. We think that God is our fortress from ourselves. We think that God is a fortress from others in the world. And in fact, God is our fortress against God himself. The reason that I think this is important is because, once again, it shows you that you, from a worldly perspective, do not matter at all. But from a heavenly perspective, matter immensely. From a worldly perspective, there's nothing... This is all happening to you. This is all happening to the world. No, nothing here shows any activity of ours. In other words, that's why I brought up the football game in the beginning. We're playing by this set of rules that we've made up, and God is carrying out an entirely different plan. And when we catch glimpses of this entirely different plan, we get mad and double down on our own rules and say, no, 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 this is right. This is what's right. This is the way we're playing. How dare you, God, come into this world and interrupt the game that we are playing. And we're playing in your honor. You should just be thankful for it. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. Calamity, bad, desolate. Like one minute there's a city, the next minute a nuclear bomb goes off, and there's rubble and desolation. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. Well, what is the desolation? He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shadows the uh, shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. What is the desolation that God is going to bring on the earth? This is, this is just... The desolation that God is going to bring on the earth is he is going to stop. He is going to put a final end. There is a final solution to man killing man. What is the desolation that God is going to bring to the earth? He's going to cause war to stop. Thought about that? That what, what was, what was it that was taking place this week over a little football game? And even the parents, we were excited. We were happy. It's like, oh, wow. And parent, one, one group of parents is excited.
excited and thrilled. The other human parents is like, yeah, they cheated. Yeah. I mean, it just, over what? Over some girls playing football in what was supposed to be like a little mock-up to the real game that was coming up. The real game is coming. This is just the shadow of it. And people are putting like life and death seriousness to it, including the players, so much so that they have animosity toward each other, their own classmates, their own school. It was supposed to be a way for that school to build up spirit for their own team against an opposing team. And instead, it's just animosity and infighting against members of their own school. Last I checked, they were all Union City Indians getting ready for a game against an opposing school. And instead, no, now they all hate each other within their own school over a game that didn't even matter. It was useless. And the whole point of that, just playing hard and fast, was the rules was to show that nothing's at stake here. This is just, I mean, everything about it was playful. God is coming to end our wars. Yes. Think about this. I was thinking about this this morning. Adam and Eve, after the fall, God tells them in his word, he speaks to them the curse. And I don't think they had any idea what was coming. He spoke to them the curse. Because you have eaten this, because you've done this, cursed is the ground because of you. There's going to be animosity between you. There's going to be animosity between you and the serpent. There's going to, I mean, the world is just in, a, in for a heap of trouble now. And the next thing that we read is Eve saying, Oh, look, with the help of the Lord, I gave birth to a man-child. Oh, wow, th that's really neat. I mean, just so innocent, so... Just innocent, right? Like, oh, God gave us a child. Wow. I mean, think about that. Happened to be new. Like, Eve had to be wondering what in the world is going on inside my body. That, that was completely new. There was no manual for that. And then she's going through this pain, and then all of a sudden she's like, I think I'm dying. What's going on? And then all of a sudden she hears the cries and realizes, a little person just came out of me. Oh, my gosh. That is so cool. Right? And then another little person comes out. Oh my gosh! I mean, the Lord's given me another little man child. And man, that is so neat. And then the one kills the other. And what must Eve have thought? Where was the first war fought? The first war was fought between Cain and Abel. Oh, there was jealousy and some Jealousy over land or jealousy over status, jealousy over occupation, I mean, the typical things, right? All the usual suspects, and one kills the other. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Like, that was, do you realize that was the first death? They're, up until that point, everything was going well. Like, Adam, Eve, their little boys, I mean, hey, everything's going great. I mean, this is just, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, granted, we have to work a little harder now to eat. I mean, I mean you know, we've got to fight thistles for our food, and that, that's a little different than what was happening in the garden. But overall, things aren't so terribly bad. I mean, we can get used to this. We can live with this until the first war. I mean, all it took was two people. Two people. I mean, we're talking, there was Adam and there was Eve, and two people in, one of them couldn't live with the other one living on the earth. Like, this world's not big enough for the both of us. I mean, one of them had to die because the world wasn't big enough. The whole world wasn't big enough for both of them. I mean, you can't live over here and I'll live over here. We'll live in peace and live and let live. No. Because I live, you have to die. I mean, one of us has to die. I'm not going to be happy until that happens. The problem is, is that the one wasn't in on that. He didn't know. He had no idea. 
that interesting? All it took was the one. All it took was the decision of the one. The world's not big enough for both of us. And he killed the other one. And the other one was probably thinking, well, what a beautiful day. I mean, wow, didn't expect that to happen today. And we are told from the Bible, God has revealed to us with his words the blessings of heaven. But we have no way of understanding what that means. Just like in the garden when God, with his words, spoke the curse. Eve had no idea what that meant. One day, one of your sons is going to kill your other son. And then they're just going to keep killing you. Your grand, don't, don't, don't cry over that because your grandkids are going to kill each other too. And their cousins and their, their cousins. And your great-grandkids are going to kill each other too. And your great-great-grandkids are going to kill each other too. I mean, who wants that as the matriarch of the family? Who wants that as the patriarch of the family? Oh, look at my family. It's wonderful. They all kill each other. I mean, oh, look, there's little Johnny playing with Joe's toys. Oh, yeah, in about three years, Johnny's going to kill Joe because of it. Like, who does that at the family reunion? Who thinks that's going to happen? And doesn't it still happen today? I guarantee you if people could get away with killing each other, they would. Let someone pass away and watch the siblings fight. No, Dad wanted me to have that. No, Mom wanted me to have that. No, 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 yeah, you, you always thought you were the favorite one. I mean, just watch them fight and go at each other. And you swear if there wasn't a law against killing. The world hasn't changed. Except, except for God has spoken a word of blessing back into the world. Right? He spoke a curse into the world, and I guarantee you Adam and Eve had no idea how bad it was going to get. And it has gotten bad. But God has also spoken a blessing into the world, and I guarantee you that none of us understands how good it's going to get. We have no idea. He's spoken it, but the words are like, yeah, I, yeah, I understand. The less I... But we have no idea because we haven't experienced it. The day is coming. And in the meantime, all we can do is trust that God is our fortress until the blessing is received. The curse has been received. It's coming to fulfillment. It just keeps getting worse and worse, so much so that Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And we all think, oh, yeah, well, it's not, I don't ever remember it being this bad before. We all try to interpret that through our own personal experience. But if history has told us anything, you can't do that. I mean, so many people thought that World War II was the end of the world. They thought, well, here it is. This is it. I mean, all the, the Bible's coming true. All the things the Bible said, they're coming true. And pretty soon, God's going to come back. And he didn't. The one thing that we are always assured of is that God is our fortress when he comes to bring an end to the wars. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. I, that is, I mean, when you think about the world, that is our experience. War. War. But it is, I mean, some people think, well, what, what? If you could say that there's something that is unique to man, there's something that is the pinnacle of man's existence, what, like, what does he aspire to? What does man aspire to? What does he achieve? What is the result of all of his labors and efforts? What is it that is the chief characteristic of man? Is it... Art. I mean, you don't see monkeys out drawing pictures and painting. I mean, is, it, is it art? Is it? I mean, they make music. Or, is it ingenuity and innovation? I mean, you know, they, they're the only ones that created a jet plane. I mean, <coughs> maybe it's. Is it love? I mean, they get married. And they, they, I mean, marriage is universal. <coughs> and, and, and romance and, and all of that. I mean, it, what what is the pinnacle of? Humanity. What is the chief characteristic of humanity? Well, I would say that through the history of man, one thing is for sure, war 
has never ended. Everything exists for the sake of war. I, mean, I would argue that you don't, nobody wants war for the sake of peace. That, that's, a, that's a myth. We think that that's what's happening. Well, we've just got to, if we have enough war, we will finally get to the point of peace. Eventually, all the evildoers will be cast off. I mean, right? There can't be peace while radical Muslims are living in Afghanistan. Well, then there can't ever be peace, right? Because there will always be radical Muslims living out in Afghanistan. No, 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 not if we would send enough troops over there, there wouldn't. Well, what are you suggesting? Well, that you got to put them in their place and de-radicalize them. And the only thing they know is force. And they're thinking, the only thing those Westerners know is force. Look at how they built all these weapons. Look at how they are over here in our land with their ships and their planes flying over our houses. And what makes them think they have the right to do that? And they were doing that long before 9-11. I mean, they've always been over in our business. They've always been over here. They, they're imperialists. They're, they're always around. And we think, no, 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 we're spreading each other on a large scale. There's going to be wars. Lots and lots and lots of wars. We have gotten so good at war, you don't even realize there's wars going on anymore. Right? I mean, you know, there's wars going on right now. Like, people are getting limbs blown off and stuff. Right now, they could be. Right now. And here we are. You think, man, it's so gruesome. Darn it, your sermon today is just such a downer. It's so gruesome. Well, here's your hope. One day, the Lord is going to bring such a desolation on the earth that there will be no one left to kill each other. Isn't that amazing that we have so destroyed the world of God that he has to completely take us off the earth to keep us from further wrecking it. The only way to keep you from completely wrecking the world is to just take all of you off of it. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. In the midst of all of it, not, not even wars here, in the midst of all of the final desolation, know, be still, and know, that God is God. He is our fortress. He's not talking about be still and know that I am God. I hear that all the time. People say that to one another. Like, oh, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really anxious this week. And so we'll, oh, I know you've been really struggling with anxiety. So I went to the Christian bookstore and I bought you this neat little plaque that says, be still and know I am God. Yeah, that, that works. That works. But that's not what he's talking about here. Be still and know that I am God. He's talking about when we need protected from him. He's talking about when we need protection from the desolation that he is going to bring. Be still and know that I am God. I will be your fortress. The desolation that is coming will not destroy you. He's already told us, don't fear the one who can kill you on earth. Don't fear the one who can kill your earthly body. Don't, don't fear him. Fear the one that after the body is dead has the authority to cast your soul into hell. Him you should fear. So in God's mind, the, the wars, that's business as usual. That's been business as usual since Cain killed Abel. What what is new? Do not be surprised at the fiery trial that's going to come upon you as though something strange is happening. It's not strange. You will always hear of wars and rumors of wars, and because of that, famines and pestilence and disease and 
You'll always hear of all of those things, and all of them have as their root war. War goes through and leaves pestilence and famine in its wake. So he's not saying here, God is your refuge and strength from those who will kill your earthly body. He's already said, don't worry about them. I can sleep tonight with my doors unlocked because God is my refuge and strength. True, you can also sleep with your doors unlocked tonight because God said, don't fear the one that's going to come in and kill you in your sleep. Don't fear him at all. No big deal. Fear the one that once you are dead has the authority to cast your spirit into hell. Fear him and we have nothing to fear because the one who can do that tells us, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Because he wants to be exalted, he wants worship. He wants praise. He saves. He saves a remnant. Out of the mass of fallen, broken humanity, out of the mass of the murderers, he rescues a remnant to spend eternity in bliss with them. Clap your hands. The 47th follows, I believe, the 46th. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. What's the result? What's the result? of God exalting himself, of being our fortress, of bringing desolation on the earth, which is nothing more than the ending of human desolation. What is the result of that? Joy, bliss, praise. Clap your hands and shout to God with loud songs of joy. It's almost like he's foreshadowing heaven here. It's almost like in these two psalms, he's foreshadowing the end of the world and the beginning of the new one. Shout for joy. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. And he's finally subdued everyone. Whom he hasn't destroyed, he has subdued. They know their place. They've been given a new heart. The murderous heart of Adam has been pulled out. And a heart of Jesus has been put in. They no longer want to kill each other. You know that's going to be one of the most beautiful aspects of heaven. I won't want to kill you. Mm. Like, you will never get on my nerves in heaven. Mm. And I will never get on yours. Some of you are like, eh, you could, you, uh, we'll see about that. No, heaven will be perfect, and therefore I will be perfect, and you will be perfect, and you will see my perfection, as I have always seen it. <laughs> the most beautiful thing is that God has subdued me. That, that is beautiful. That in heaven, we will have a king and no desire for revolution. Wow. I mean, my daughter, she's in college now. Y'all, some of you know that. We were talking, I was asking her how classes were going. Of course, she's taking political science classes, and so I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, you're just, you're getting an earful. She said, among, among the, you have to forgive me for quoting, but, among the brilliant nuggets of wisdom that she has heard was this idea from one of her fellow students that 
I believe it was 70. Is that right? People, 70. That people over 70 should not have the right to vote because they oh. are going to die anyway. Oh. That's one of these wonderful children. That's somebody's daughter. I mean, that's the logic. You know how far it is from that to if you're 70 and you're going to die anyway, why would you continue to use up the resources of everybody else? You have an obligation to die. You know how close that is, those two ideas? If you've given up the right to vote, then you have no say also in your future. And you have an obligation to move on so that those are still alive. I mean, and do you know where that kind of thinking comes from? That kind of thinking comes from, oh, I don't know, political rallies where someone would say, my grandma is needing, you know, some high-priced medical things. How are we going to pay for it? And the leader of the free world at that time would say something like this. Maybe she just needs some aspirin. Maybe we just need to help her. We have all kinds of ways to make her forget how pitiful her existence is. I mean, you know, we got morphine and it's pretty cheap. I mean, we can just keep her drugged up. And, you know, I mean, there's no reason to give her a new heart. There's no reason to do another bypass. There's no reason for all this. I mean, we, you just keep her drugged up. until they, That's the president. That's his idea of hope and change. Right? And then you wonder where the logic comes in the next generation that comes forward and says, well, yeah, people over 70, I mean, gosh, why would they even have a vote? It's not fair. I mean, they're going to vote for the world that they're not even going to be inhabiting. They're going to set us up with all kinds of things that we don't want, and then they're going to turn around and die. And so really, notice the hubris. Notice the pomp and the arrogance, and we're going to see that next week in the next song. The pomp. This young lady could walk down the street after class back to her room and a tree fall on her head and she has no say in the world that will come. We are all one breath away from death, whether 70 or six months. The arrogance of playing by a different set of rules. That's all it is. Well, we're making the rules. We're, we're the ones. It is going to be beautiful to live in a world where we will have a king and no beginnings of revolution. No beginnings of it. Words have consequences. And when enough people talk that way, I mean, how do you think those things happened in Russia, in China, in Venezuela, in Cuba, all of those places? That's how they started in Germany. How did they start? They started with words and policies and ended in death. Well, that's the same thing that happened with Cain and Abel. In Cain's mind, he had a policy. The world would be better off without Abel in it. There was no one else to vote. There was no one else to persuade. There was no coalition to build. Well, wait a minute, Cain. You need to build a coalition of allies and get the world's permission first so that they don't turn on us and think that we're looney tunes and we're rogue nations and they're all going to turn on us and hate us. And so there was nobody else. There was just Cain. So in Cain's mind, when that policy made sense, and nothing has changed. And it will not change until heaven. You cannot vote peace into this world. There is no peace. And what does the Bible say? Woe to you who say peace, peace, when there is no peace. In other words, woe to you. That, that's not a punishment. That's not saying you're going to be punished for saying peace, peace. No, no, no. Woe to you because the woe is coming. Jesus said, those who do not believe in the Son of God are condemned already. The woe is just the pronouncement of that. Like, you guys are saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. You keep thinking that the way that you are thinking will lead to peace. I'm sure that that lady, that young lady in 
Sydney's class would not think of herself as a murderous revolutionary. I highly doubt that that's what is going on in her mind. Like, kill all the grandparents. I guarantee that's not what she's thinking. But that's where it ends. That's where it goes. She's not thinking that. She's literally thinking, I know how to make the world a better place. I know how to bring peace. I am so thankful that there will be a day when our heritage is protected safely in heaven because we have a king who has successfully subdued all of our murderous intentions. Verse 5, Psalm 47, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. Just, it's beautiful. We have a king, and rather than trying to overthrow him and kill him, we praise him. We praise him. We sing praises to him. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. What is being foretold here? Heaven. Heaven is being foretold here. When all of the princes of the world will either be in the lake of fire or gathered around the throne of God in submission. All of the shields will be lined up around God. All the arms have been put down. All the bows and arrows and spears have been broken. And nothing is left but praise to God. This is what God is carrying out in the world. Will the legalists just get with the program? Will those who think that something amazing is happening by their obedience just get with the program? Something far bigger than the fact that you skipped over HBO in your channel surfing is happening. Something far bigger than you is taking place in the world. And oh, how we have such a hard time believing that. How we have such a hard time believing in our own insignificance. For beloved, when you ask of the Bible, what is the part that we are to play? What is my role in all of this great plan, God? The answer is unequivocal from Scripture. Oh, dear child, you are one of the murderers who's being saved. We are the change that we want to see in our world. We are the only Jesus some people will ever see. God says, you, you're looking at the field and you're making up all the wrong rules to it. I hate being a murderer. I hate it. I hate it. But I am. I am. Yesterday, my wife and I were on our way to a wedding. We were in kind of a little bit of a hurry. On our way to a wedding. Oh, what a beautiful thing. A picture of Christ in the church and all the love and the romance and all that. And I'm sitting behind a car and he's looking back and forth, both ways. Back and forth. And he wasn't going. I could look at his head in there over the seat, looking back and I'm like, what are you looking for? Like, and he finally went and I was like, there's stop signs here, moron. Like, those were my words. Like, do you realize you don't have to keep looking back and forth? It's stop signs. Like, there's no oncoming flowing traffic. What are you looking for? And I said that. I said, there's stop signs, moron. And went on my way. And after I said it, I was thinking, woe to you that say, you fool. 
But how many steps is it from moron to murder? How many steps? How dare you be on the road in the place that belongs to me at this moment? I'm in a hurry. And you're acting like you have all the time in the world to just look back and forth for oncoming cars that are never coming. Don't you know that that spot is rightfully mine? You should not exist here. And we've had this conversation, my wife and I, about driving and stuff. And she's like, do you realize nobody is probably in their car thinking, how can I ruin your day? Nobody's in their car giving you a second thought. They're just driving. They don't care. They're not, they're, it's no, there's no animosity there. And you keep attributing like evil to them. And she's right. I do. Like, you made me do this. You made me do that. You <laughs> pull out in front of me and make me slow down. That, real nice. I never do that to anybody until I do. And then when I do, of course, it goes away with just a, oh, sorry, buddy. I mean, I missed time. That's all it takes when I do it. Oh, sorry, buddy. How do I know that that's not what he's saying in his car? Oh, sorry, buddy. I'm like, you son of a, you made me take off my cruise control. I do that all the time. You have no right to exist on my roads. I'm your pastor. That's the hate I have in my heart. That's the murderer saying, you might think, oh, that's all it is. I, no, 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 that bleeds over into everything. I mean, right? I'm part of the problem. I'm, I'm not the only Jesus people will see. Jesus is the only Jesus people will see. And all the ones who are meant to see him will see him and Amen. worship Amen. and praise and stand in awe and be in heaven someday. Not because of me. I am the one who, when he reads the 46th and 47th Psalm, says, Thank you, Lord, for being my refuge and strength. Thank you, Lord, for making yourself highly exalted in my sight, because I would never do that on my own. Given my own proclivities, I would put you on the cross like the Pharisees did, and I would party like the sons of Cain did, and I would never give you a second thought, and I would gladly die on the earth as an earth dweller. Without, without the word of God penetrating my heart, without the plan of God bringing me home, I am hopeless. Beloved, this week as we go through our lives, just ponder the bigness. When you read the headlines, realize nothing strange is happening. Just ponder the bigness of the plan of God. That someday, he will bring all of this to an end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you will be exalted over the nations. That the leaders of the nations will bow, bend a knee to you. That in vain, we, inhabitants of the world, have turned our rage against you. It will mean nothing on that day when you bring desolations to the earth and cease our wars. Lord, we long for the day that you will lift the curse on this world. For God, we look around it and we see, we see the devastation, the misery, the heartbreak, the deceit, the schemes, the ambitions. We see the evil in the world and we see the evil mirrored in our own hearts. And we long for the day that you will bring us to that pure place called heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.